Good morning, everyone, and welcome into this very special Earth Week conversation series with Conservation Law Foundation. Now, we're thrilled you can join us this week and hear from these influential women in literature, medicine, religion, and the youth movement who each bring a unique perspective on environmentalism. Now, it will be a wonderful conversation, and we hope you enjoy it. But if you do have any technical issues, our event manager, Katie Ardry, is standing by to help you out. You can contact her directly via email at kardrey at clf.org. That's K-A-R-D-R-E-Y at clf.org. Kitty will take care of everything for you. So without further ado, I'll hand things over to our speakers and enjoy the broadcast. Hello and welcome. My name is Phelps Turner. I'm a senior attorney at Conservation Law Foundation in Maine. For those of you not familiar with CLF, we are an environmental advocacy group that uses the law, science, and markets to create lasting solutions for New England's most critical environmental challenges. Because of our deep ties and connections in communities across New England, we're able to move the needle on complicated issues locally that can influence what's happening nationally. Thanks for joining us today to kick off this special Earth Day series. We're very excited to have Amara Ifeji as our first guest of the week. Amara serves as the Grassroots Development Coordinator at Maine Environmental Education Association where she works to encourage underrepresented students to become environmental stewards and climate justice activists. She's a freshman at Northeastern University, where she's majoring in politics, philosophy, and economics, with a concentration in energy and environmental policy. And Amara was recently named a National Geographic Young Explorer, an honor that goes to just 24 young environmentalists around the world. Amara, thanks for being here with us today. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, first, congratulations on being named a National Geographic Youth Explorer. That's quite an honor. Um, can you tell me what was your reaction when you heard you were receiving this global recognition? And can you tell us about the project that you were recognized for? Yeah, so um, when I first heard the news about National Geographic, to say that I was taken aback would be quite the understatement. Um, it's it's actually a really funny story how um, I was actually featured in National Geographic just um, a year earlier, um, but this was actually um, haphazardly. I just happened to be in a picture um, at a science fair. Um, and so um, me looking off into the distance made it into the magazine itself. And then fast forward a year later to be named um, as a young explorer. I mean, it was such a gratifying experience. Um, and in terms of the project that I was recognized for, it was really my work with the Maine Environmental Education Association, where I serve as the grassroots development coordinator. Um, we have a network of um, over 400 youth across the state of Maine who are championing such amazing environmental and civic engagement initiatives in their communities. And so in being a rec recognized for this honor, it was really my work with these youth, um, empowering them to spark this change. Uh, th thanks and congratulations again. Can you tell us a little bit about when and how you first connected with nature and, and when, when did that connection transform into uh, environmental activism? Yeah, so, my first experiences with the environment, um, I guess, weren't really experiences with the environment. There were more so a lot thereof. Um, I grew up in the DC metropolitan area. Um, I lived in a household that had upwards of 14 people living in it at one point. Um, and so with such a hectic household, um, I really found that it, the environment was a place that um, I could get um, I could seek solace um, uh, away from the, the, the busy nature of, of my home. Um, and although I was really passionate about the environment from a very young age because of um, what it could afford me, I didn't really find that I had that many opportunities to connect with the environment, um, mainly because of um, my identity as uh, a BIPOC youth um, as well as my socioeconomic identity as well. And so when I um, entered high school, I really still did not have many opportunities. So I began to self-seek those opportunities. And the first opportunity that really um, 
solidified my passion was attending the stormwater management and research team summer institute up at the university of maine and there i fell in love with not only the environment but specifically water quality and water justice and advocating for water as an essential right to um, all those who reside on this earth um, and that really is what sparked my environmental activism because i recognize that um, there is such an intersectional nature between uh, the climate movement, the environmental movement, and then the barriers um, that I face um, as being part of um, a community of color, um, being part of a socioeconomically underserved background. Um, in recognizing this intersection, that's really how my environmental activist was born. Great, and th thanks. And we, we, and we all know that people of color and indigenous people, let alone youth, have been un underrepresented or not given an ample voice in the environmental movement. What can we do to change that? And how can groups like CLF amplify those voices to, to make sure that there are seats at the table? Yeah, um, so it, it is so true. There is such a disparity in terms of who is engaging and who has a seat at the table when it comes to issues of um, the environment. Um, one thing that my organization really strives for is having those affected by decisions at the decision-making table. And yes, immense strides have been made, especially in the state of Maine, where the youth climate movement is really just so tremendous. There's amazing networks and coalitions, organizations doing amazing work. But still, um, this is at the grassroots level. And I feel as though there still could be so much change that could be made, especially at the policy level, at the board level, where youth traditionally have not had spaces to engage, as well as BIPOC youth have not had um, spaces to engage. And I think in in really addressing these barriers to access, it really comes down to having equitable opportunities for youth, for BIPOC youth specifically as communities of color are the ones who are disproportionately um, affected by the climate crisis, have a seat at this table and take part in the decision-making process. Um, I think what that could look like is really providing these opportunities in terms of paying youth for their time um, and paying BIPOC folks for their lived experiences, honoring their stories, honoring the challenges that they face because of the climate crisis, recognizing that and stipending them for their time. It is, for me, I had a lot of issues engaging in my passion because a lot of the times was the trade-off was, okay, I could go and I could do um, community science efforts um, in an unpaid internship, or I could go and I could work at my grocery store and save up for college that was coming in the near future. And for me, that decision was, um, of course, a hard one, but for some youth, some other youth from other um, marginalized backgrounds, that might be an even harder decision of, okay, I can go engage in my passion or I can go take care of a family member or I can help to contribute to food on the table. That's why it's so important that these opportunities to engage in the sector are equitable and recognize the trade-offs that youth and BIPOC, BIPOC individuals, marginalized individuals face in engaging in these spaces. I think in having you know, more of these opportunities, it will really allow for other individuals who don't traditionally engage in these spaces to have the opportunity to be able to do so and not have to make those difficult trade-offs in, in engaging in their passions. Uh, thanks for sharing those insights. Um, you've been outspoken about your experiences with racism, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the intersection of environmentalism and racial justice. Yeah, so I really do think that um, environmental justice is racial justice, it is social justice. All of these social issues are interconnected, they are linked, they are one in the same. Um, it was at the Maine Environmental Education Association's Changemakers Gathering, an annual app gathering that um, Mia, for short, hosts for its youth um, to learn about intersectional environmentalism that I realized that these issues were linked. Um, I heard from 
Vic Barrett. Um, they are one of the 21 youth suing the federal government in the Juliana versus um, the United States uh, court case um, around um, knowingly um, harming um, communities of color, youth, individuals in our society when it comes to environmental exploitation. In hearing Vic speak, I was able to make the connection that it was really the generational trauma that my parents had, my grandparents had when I was growing up in Maryland. That was one of the barriers that I face in first connecting and fostering a connection to place with the environment the generational trauma that many BIPOC individuals have, because historically, the violence that has been per perpetuated against us has been in the outdoors, in an outdoor setting. So we have that fear in just going for a hike, going for a nature walk, um, and things of that sort, because of this fear, because of this trauma. I recognize that my socioeconomic status was a barrier in engaging in, in, in environmentalism. Um, I mean, I moved to Maine when I was nine. And so in to Maine, um, there is snow on the ground, um, maybe eight months out of the year. So a lot of connecting with the environment that I would do would be in the winter. But um, sometimes the trade-off was you know, are we gonna get um, snow pants, snowshoes, outdoor gear, or are we gonna be able to um, put it towards other things like paying for the bills and, and for food and things like that. So I recognize that my barriers to access really had to do with my identity. That is not just by any sense of the word. I'm, it's just the privileged few that should have a right to be able to connect with the natural world especially in the state of Maine, I think our state is absolutely beautiful. And we should really make it so that everyone is able to connect with the environment, especially youth, um, especially BIPOC youth, in order to create more positive stories, more positive experiences, and to kind of rewrite this generational trauma that BIPOC individuals have. And so my work really focuses on um, creating these more positive experiences for BIPOC youth through our Change Makers Network, allowing them to connect in a safe setting um, in the environment um, so that they can foster these more positive experiences engaging with the natural world. And so um, it really starts with first fostering a connection to place with the outdoors. And from there, um, tackling the systemic issues rooted in the um, in the climate crisis and the environmental crisis and how um, communities of color, frontline communities are those who um, really are facing the repercussions of the climate crisis. So, I mean, of course it starts first in, um, in a connection, but then we need to address these systemic issues as well. You mentioned the, the Juliana case and talked about the, the importance of opportunities for, for BIPOC youth. And I think it's pretty clear over the last few years that it's, it's really been youth voices that have carried the most weight in, in spurring climate action. And I'm wondering, why do you think that those voices are finally being listened to? I think that youth voices are finally being listened to because I think that no longer they um, have a choice but to listen. The climate crisis is extremely pressing. It is um, evidence-based, it is data-based. Um, I, I just, I link everything back to the state of Maine because it really does have such a special place in my heart. The Gulf of Maine is warming 99% faster than all the world's oceans. Having done four years of water quality management, I can see the effects that um, climate-induced um, heavy storm events have had on um, the Penobscot watershed um, and how it has really led to the um, impairment of the watershed and certain and certain streams and brooks in the watershed as well. I think these voices are being listened to now because we, we no longer have a choice in addressing the issues that the climate crisis is bringing up. Um, and with that, um, I also think that adults really now look to youth not as, you know, it's important to get youth voices. It's, it's important to have a diversity of perspective just because, just to say, you know, we have one youth 
we are engaging youth in that way. I no longer think that is the narrative. I think now when engaging youth, um, at least from the experiences that I've had, it has been because adults now want to, uh, referencing something I said earlier, engage those in the decision-making that are most affected by these decisions. Youth are not the future of tomorrow. Youth are the future of today. So engaging youth perspectives in this work will really allow for those who will be most affected by any policy changes, any grassroots level changes that come out of the environmental sector for them to have a say in, in what the future holds. With the challenging year we've just been through, Amara, and, and continue to go through, how, how do you think we can keep young people engaged and mobilized w when there are so many challenges um, d demanding our, our attention? Yeah, there are like s s numerous challenges um, that society faces. And um, in keeping youth engaged, um, I think that it's really important to um, support youth in their efforts in doing so. I must name that I myself have faced um, quite a bit of burnout in activism and organizing spaces, especially in this past year where everything has shifted to digital, um, 2D, if you will, organizing. Um, you know, Zoom burnout is a thing. Um, there, there's a lot of burnout in this, and I think it's most important that we support youth in their wellness. We support youth in um, their their passions um, and their efforts to mobilize around um, so many of these different social and environmental issues. Um, that might be through really um, making sure youth have what they need in terms of um, maybe it's donating to a youth-led organization, um, maybe it, it is offering resources as a community partner or offering up mentorship. I know that for me, intergenerational collaboration has been one of the key forms of um, addressing these issues that I have faced in my work. So having an adult mentor, an adult ally in this work has really served me so well. And I think these things together can really help to keep young folks engaged and mobilized in this work moving forward. Um, sh shifting gears a little bit, if, if you could sit down tomorrow with uh, Governor Janet Mills of Maine or even, even President Biden, what do you think that conversation um, would be about? And what's the most important message that, that you would want to, Governor Mills or President Biden to, to take away from that conversation? Yeah, um, I think I'll continue on in the state focused theme um, and say, um, it would be so great to um, have a conversation with um, Governor Mills. I think that the thing that I would relay most is um, a message of, of gratitude I think that really I'm so grateful and fortunate to live in the state of Maine because of the urgency um, that I see around issues of um, the environment. Um, the Maine Climate Council, I think, is doing such incredible work in really pushing for le legislative change um, in the environment. Um, and I just want to um, firstly thank Governor Mills thank um, Director Pingree and, and thank everyone who works um, in the governor's office of policy and innovation for the future. Um, another one thing I would like to um, relay as well is, I guess the need for more youth voices um, at this level. Um, I think going back to, again, something I said earlier is that um, in the grassroots sphere, um, youth have so much say in our state, but in the policy sphere, that really is not the case as of yet. Uh, I think a lot of headway can still be made on engaging youth voices in policy level work with the Maine Climate Council, maybe through um, legislative efforts um, and things of that sort. And I think that is probably the biggest message that I would like to convey to Governor Mills around um, not only engaging youth, but making sure to equitably and meaningfully engage youth in this work. 
Great, Th thanks. As as a as a resident and a father and an environmental lawyer um, here in Maine, I, I I really appreciate those those inspiring uh, remarks and insights. Um, you've already accomplished so much, Amara. What, what do you envision your next chapter will look like? That is a great question. Um, I have ever changing interests. I am always eager to explore um, different um, fields and sector of the environmental movement. Um, and I think that where my passion really lies is in um, policy level efforts. Um, through my work with the Maine Environment Education Con Education Association, as well as a consortium that we're a part of, the Nature-Based Education Consortium, um, I have been able to explore, um, I guess, policy level efforts and um, really fall in love with policy advocacy, specifically um, policy that focuses on um, being able to connect youth with the natural world and afford youth opportunities to engage with the environment. Um, and so, I guess looking um, post graduation, um, I hope to pursue law school and um, maybe actually go into environmental law, um, environmental advocacy, and continue to push forward um, environmental advocacy efforts, um, both at the state and federal level. Um, great, Ed, thank you. One, one last question for you. Um, what sustains you, Amara, and, and what gives you hope? Yeah, um, that is a great question to end on. I think um, the thing that gives me the most hope really is um, just engaging in the networks and the spaces that I am able to engage in to see so many youth voices, so many BIPOC voices have a seat at the table, which is not something that has been um, the case in the past. Um, I, it gives me so much hope to see um, youth lead efforts, um, such as um, efforts at uh, the State House and um, advocating for um, environmental concerns at that level to go on to hold elected um, positions of office to advocate for the environment in that realm or to lead sustainability movements at their schools. All of these efforts all of these local efforts particularly um, just contribute so, so much. The, the climate crisis um, and environmental concerns, they are so incredibly daunting. I mean, one looks at um, climate change, a, a global phenomena, and one can feel overwhelmed, you know, how to engage, how to, um, I guess, move forward and to um, make sure these issues are addressed. I think that seeing these local efforts is really how one can best engage. And I'm so, so excited, so hopeful that I have a seat at the table being plugged into so many youth networks to be able to see and be at the forefront of, of this change, this local change that I guess will kind of percolate into national global level change. Wow, th thank you. What, what a wonderful note to, to end on. I, I want to say thank you, Amar Ifeji, for joining CLF in this special Earth Day conversation with leaders and influencers across New England. And thanks to all of you who joined today's conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to CLF's special Earth Week conversation series. Now, we're thrilled to be celebrating the 51st Earth Day with you. Now, remember, you can tune in at 10 a.m. Monday through Thursday this week and hear from all four of our speakers. Just use the link in our confirmation email to tune in again tomorrow. And as always, the conversation does not end here. Sign up for CLF's e-news by going to www.clf.org so you can stay informed and take action. You can also support CLF by donating just below this video player. A gift at any level drives our work throughout New England forward. Thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow.